This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. It has been a whirlwind of a week. We have been super busy. We're trying to finalize season 10 of the Fresh Tracks episodes, which are going to be going up on Fresh Tracks Plus first. And uh, we're trying to get our film permits. We're getting all the logistics lined up for our trips. We're trying to hire a video editor. We are getting all the video equipment lined up and getting gear ordered. We're gearing up all of our archery equipment. It's busy, but it's good. We had a visit from the Day 6 gear crew. Awesome group of people. They helped us get some new arrows set up via bear shaft tuning. It was really interesting to see a different method that I'm not used to. Fun to learn more and see another process. It's really interesting to see how passionate everyone gets about their method of tuning. I'm a huge fan of doing whatever method works best for you, for your philosophy on arrow flight and tuning. They will have a video coming up soon on that. Other than that, doing some food prep for the season. I've been making a bunch of jerky today. So excited to have a bunch of jerky for upcoming trips. Randy is down at the Total Archery Challenge. He was at Park City last week and now he is at the Big Sky event. So if you're watching this video on Friday, you can go visit Randy down at the RMEF booth with his uh, freezer full of dilly bars from Dairy Queen. So go say hi to Randy and grab a dilly bar. Unfortunately, we don't have a fishing corner this week as Michael is currently officiating his friend's wedding. But I do know that he has hit 120 days of fishing this year and has been getting some super cool footage of some dry fly action. So good stuff there. With that, we'll jump into some news. Wolves, the species that just loves to keep popping up in the news. So much passion, either in the form of love or hate. Recent news confirmed that a wolf-like dog shot in New York State last year was in fact a wolf. This was recently confirmed via a DNA test. It was commonly believed that most of the potential wolf sightings in New York were either coyotes or coyote-wolf hybrids. There has been discussion of reintroducing wolves into New York in the past, but nothing much has come of it, unlike what's happened in Colorado, where the state has been tasked with developing a plan by the end of 2023 to reintroduce wolves into Colorado. That decision came from a previous ballot initiative. There have also been multiple confirmed sightings of wolves in Colorado over the past few years, including the first documented breeding pair in over 20 years. This is before they have reintroduce them in. They are occupying it on their own. Anyway, some of that's old news, but the reason I bring it up is because of an article I recently read in the Frontiers in Conservation Science. The authors reviewed numerous scientific journal articles that researched wolves over many years, including looking at the trophic cascade effect, as well as looking at livestock killing via predation from wolves. And what they found was wildly unsurprising. They noted how stories that are often shared outside of the scientific community were very often dramatically overstated. Whether it was via a lobbyist, a newspaper article, social media, advocacy groups, whatever it might be. The common story often shared in favor of wolves is the idea of this massive trophic cascade. To do this, we gotta set it up right. So cue the dramatic and inspirational music. There we go, okay. So, let's, oh, let's EQ my voice a bit too. There we go. Wolves can change rivers. When wolves start to hunt elk, they reduce the herd and change the behavior of the prey. Habitats that have been ravaged by overgrazing of elk immediately flourish with new aspen stands and brush that returns, which allows the birds to return. The beavers came back. In fact, every species returned into the area. The increased vegetation stabilized the banks of the river, reduced erosion, causing the streams to change, which brought back all of the fish too. Or on the contrary, the other story that is told, cue the dramatic but ominous music. Okay. The wolves that were reintroduced into Yellowstone came from giant Canadian stock, which are 67% larger than what originally inhabited the area. When they move into a new area, they will decimate game populations to the point where all you see is wolf tracks. They will indiscriminately kill hundreds of domestic sheep without eating a single one. They often surplus kill purely for fun. Livestock production in areas with wolves is completely uneconomical. So, this review article looked into much of the claims of these stories and attempted to find science that backed up their claims. And what they found in numerous studies is that there was no conclusive evidence to back up the extreme claims on either side. I thought this was a really interesting read because it kind of just brought everything back into reality. But one of the best and simplest ways I've heard it summed up from one of Randy's favorite quotes that I believe he stole from Arthur Middleton, which is that wolves are wolves, but they don't have a rainbow shooting out of their asshole. 
In Alaska, the Federal Subsistence Board just voted to close down doll sheep hunting to all users within two large units in the Brooks Range for the next two years. Essentially, they closed down virtually all doll sheep hunting that is accessed via the Hall Road or the Dalton Highway. Numerous members of the public, along with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, gave comments and opposed this action. The ADF and G had a very detailed report articulating their opposition to this. Nonetheless, the subsistence board voted unanimously to close the season. One of their arguments was that there was a lack of doll sheep rams in the two to five year old range. And they were arguing that the larger mature rams that are normally harvested through hunting need to be protected in order to have successful breeding. I'm not a biologist, but reading through the working session, I got the feeling that the subsistence board was making decisions based on anecdotal evidence, while Alaska Department of Fish and Game was using science and hard data. Alaska is one of the few places where federal management of game species is able to have large impacts on the availability of game to hunters. It's a touchy, complicated subject that is probably going to keep popping up in the future. Randy and I previously did a deeper dive on this in the past where you can listen to us talk about Anilka and all of the complicated facets of it in episode 11 of Fresh Tracks Weekly. I still have a lot to learn for sure. Keeping with the Alaska theme, in the most recent issue of Wildlife Professional, the Wildlife Society publication, many of the articles focused on managing wildlife in changing environments with a lot of examples in Alaska. They defined a management strategy to deal with changing climate and habitat with the acronym RAD, which stands for Resist, Accept, and Direct. So for the resist part, an example would be pushing back against the change, such as when an invasive species comes into an area to actively remove that invasive species, such as invasive pigs coming into an area, you can actively trap or shoot, remove them, or in the case of invasive plants, using herbicide or mechanically removing them to make sure they don't take over native plants. For an example of the ACCEPT part of the acronym was in Alaska, Pacific salmon moving north into rivers due to warming water temps in stretches that they never used to exist. Largely, both the public and management agencies accept this as people generally like the fish and its newly suitable habitat. One of the potential examples of the DIRECT part of the acronym was on the Kenai Peninsula, where the habitat is changing from forested areas into more of a grassland. The warming temperatures allowed for a bark beetle outbreak, which in turn helped fuel wildfire taking out a forest. Managers are considered directing wildlife management there by introducing bison as a large grazer. There are no large grazers in the area, but they could fill this ecological niche in this newly formed grassland. Anyway, the moral of the story is that as we face changing habitats and environments, keeping things the exact same by doing nothing will not be an option. Either we have to combat the change by resisting, accept the changes are here and just let it happen, or actively direct the future of the change into a desirable situation. Well, that is all I have for this week's episode. We are skipping the deeper dive this week, but if you have anything you would like to let us know, you can email us at weekly at freshtracks.tv. Thanks.